Hi, uh, Jeff. Thanks for your inquiry about LAK or local anisotropy Krieging. I had this set of PowerPoint slides prepared some time ago, but I thought I would just annotate it here with a little bit of vo voice so that I uh, explain a few things that might help make sense out of this. Okay, what is uh, LAK? Well, this little series of, of PowerPoint slides here, there are basically four topics. Why motivation or why bother with LAK? What is it? How can we validate the results? And a little bit about the LAK software. So motivation. <clears throat> well, there are two questions one must answer when designing a Krieging plan for the estimation of a resource or a great control block model. And the first is, what sample should we select to estimate a block grade, right? And the second one is, once you have those samples selected to estimate the block grade, how should you weight them? Okay, well, there are a lot of common solutions to sample selection. For example, we build lithologic models and then restrict the sample selection by lithology. Similarly, we try alteration models or grade shells. Sometimes it's structural domains, and then we have things like soft, firm, hard contact analysis, and so on and so on. Well, these solutions are... Um, <clears throat> They're practical at the scale of the deposit. You know, this is where you can take your cross sections, plot your drill hole data on it, and then, uh, for example, design or, or uh, <coughs> design your boundaries of your various zones or geologic models or so on and so on. But not practical at local scales. And what do we mean by local scales? Well, for example, consider a blast in a bench, something like this picture here. All these white arrows show little patterns of mineralization that have specific directions. And as you can see from this, the directions are quite variable. Okay, so that's what we mean by a local <coughs> patterns of mineralization, particularly where the directions change. And they're over small distances, maybe two or three blast holes, something like that. And so to interpret that manually or something is just not practical. So what do we do? An alternative, then, is something called local anisotropy Krieging, and so I'll try and illustrate that here. We have a purple and uh, light uh, blue or cyan rock types, and this is the border here. These are drill holes coming down, and so we have a block here, and here we have a s orientation of a search neighborhood for the whole pink domain. And so when you're estimating this block here, obviously that search neighborhood works fairly well, quite well, because you're only picking up samples that belong to that particular pink domain from, from the drill holes. But you do get into problems over here where that particular orientation now ends up with samples collecting across the domain boundary, and so we get a mixture here that we might not want to have. So LAK go ahead. It, what LAK does is customize the local search neighborhood so that we tend to minimize the mixture of samples from different st statistical populations simply by orienting the uh, changing the orientation of the search neighborhood as well as the anisotropy axes. Okay, I'm going to show you an example here. Uh, and so here, what, I, what this slide is meant to show you what I have done on the next illustration. So we had a block here, and initially the search ellipsoid is much larger than the block. So what I did is I shrunk the search neighborhood in the, in the just for the illustration purposes, so that they don't overlap one another in, in, in the visual, you know, it's a little clearer for you to see what's going on. So I shrunk the search neighborhood, then I removed the block, and so you're going to look at a map of just search neighborhoods like this. But remember, they initially were much larger than what you're seeing here. So this is it. I've kind of colored the uh, ellipsoids here uh, by their grade. Blue is uh, the very lowest grade. It's sort of uh, veins of uh, some sort of um, uh, intrusive that's not mineralized. Our high grade stuff is here in the red. And you can see patterns, you know, you got some low grade green 
crap here and you can see how the search neighborhoods tend to circle that so that they minimize you know mixing these green samples with the yellow samples and so on so there's various things like this all over the all over this figure so this is a, a figure what local anisotropy might look like <clears throat> okay in this case here it's on an or control model and i think we were using blast holes so it's a fairly regular pattern LAK um, <clears throat> defines a search neighborhood from sample data. So it's a little bit like multiple indicator Krieging in the sense that it needs lots of data. It, it likes to have a lot of data. So if you have a resource model where the data is very, very sparse, LAK is not going to work. Likely it's not going to work very well there for you. Okay, what about local anisotropy variography? Well, let's say that when you do variography, you set this blue thing here is what we call our separation vector. Remember, we're pairing, you know, two drill hole composites, one at the tail end of the separation vector, one at the head of the separation vector, and then we measure the distance between the two drill hole composites and the direction. And the direction is generally with regard to the x and the x and the y axis of your coordinate system. Okay, so, <clears throat> and then we calculate the variegum value from those two drill hole samples and then go on to the next two. In this picture, I've centered a search ellipsoid on one drill hole composite here, and within this ellipsoid, the search neighborhood, I found another drill hole composite. There's my separation vector, as I've already pointed out. But the only difference now is that I calculate the direction of this vector with ref by referencing it to the major axis of the search ellipsoid. So that means it, that is north. So that line there then is regarded as north. And so the direction of this arrow would be, if you look at how many degrees off of north that is, it might be something like 30 degrees, right? So the azimuth the separation vector here, the azimuth of that would be 30 degrees if we reference it to the north axis of the search ellipsoid. If we reference it to this north here, which is reference to the coordinate system of your data, well, then it's probably closer to 80 degrees, right? So north would be straight up, east would be 90 out this way, so it's closer to 80. So, <clears throat> so the difference with LA variography is that we are calculating the direction reference to the axes of the ellipsoid. So in this example here, suppose you had a strata bound mineralization. These are meant to be drill holes coming down through here. And here we have search ellipsoids that tend to be parallel to the contacts. And so therefore, if we were calculating, uh, this would always be north, remember, the, ellip the long axes of the ellipsoid. So it's kind of like unfolding the strata to get a true measure of the direction. Okay, only we don't really have to unfold it. The ellipsoid orientation of the ellipsoids unfolds it for us. <coughs> so how can we check uh, LAK validation to know whether or not it's uh, doing anything good for us? Well, we can look at global means and then look at the ore loss and the dilution rate. So we can um, do something like a cross-validation. And if we want to compare LAK to, for example, ordinary Krieging or inverse distance squared or whatever other algorithm you like, we can do cross-validation with, for example, ordinary Krieging or with your interpreter. And we can also do it with local anisotropy Krieging and then compare the results. And so how do, what are the results? Well, on the x-axis here, this is AU hat. Hat means it's an estimate. So that's our Krieg grade or inverse distance grade or whichever algorithm you're using. And then here we plot the on the y-axis the actual, in this case, blast hole grade. You could also do this with, let's say, resource uh, drill hole composites. So each one of these points, so that point where my cursor is at, would say that we estimated that grade to be roughly about 1.45 whatever it is, grams per ton or something. But in fact, the real grade, <clears throat> uh, 1.4, was only like maybe somewhere about 0.15, and we estimated it to be 1.45.
Okay, so each one of these points is an estimate and a real grade. So then we can look at <clears throat> different rates here. So we can put in a cutoff at some cutoff that's of interest here. And then we can calculate the number of points that are in this quadrant here. So the cutoff of here is at 0.5. We draw a line across there. I draw a line here at 0.5 up here. That divides all of our points into four quadrants. Then we can count the points, number of points, or the proportion of points that are in this quadrant. And these are points that are what? Waste to ore. So this means that the actual grade of these points here, the true grade here, is waste because it's below cutoff. But our estimator has said, no, 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 those are above cutoff, so they are ore. So it's, we have reclassified waste blast holes as ore. So this waste to ore. So that's a misclassification. Similarly, in this quadrant up here, we have a misclassification where the estimates have said, nope, it's waste. But look at the true blast hole grades and say, oh no, it's above cutoff, so it's actually ore. So this is ore to waste, so it's a misclassification that way. So obviously these are rates. So we can say, for example, we have 6.1% ore to waste, we have 22.3% waste to ore, <clears throat> and so on. <clears throat> we can calculate that these guys in this quadrant here are correctly estimated to be above cutoff. These guys in this quadrant are correctly estimated to be below cutoff. So we can get the grade, the estimated grade of this and the true grade of this and compare and so on. So we can do that for LAK, we can do that for OK, and it'll give us a pretty good idea whether LAK is helping us, yes or no. That's for a reserve or a resource model. <clears throat> for a grade control model, we might want to check the conditional bias. And again, we make a scatter plot like this. And on the bottom or the x-axis, we plot the estimated grade or Krieg grade and the true grade on the y-axis. And then <clears throat> we look at the slope of the regression line. And that slope of the regression line should be 1. And why should it be 1? Well, if it's 1, then it means the average grade of our estimates, we predict that the average grade above cutoff is going to be whatever it happens to be, then that's actually what we will deliver to the mill because we're conditionally unbiased. So if you look at these things here, you can see here's the average estimated grade greater than 0.6 grams per ton. That's by this histogram here, right? Because all of these points are greater than 0.6. Now, if it's conditionally unbiased, that means that all of these points here should also have the same average grade as this histogram. This histogram, however, notice it's got grades that are below cutoff. It's got grades that run all the way from zero to 2.9 or whatever that is, so that histogram. But this histogram has to have the same mean as this histogram, and then that means whatever we predict, that's what the mill is actually going to get on average. There's no bias. Okay, so that's another check. We can do that. We can compare LAK to ordinary Krieging or whatever other estimator you're using. Another thing we can do is calculate swath plots. <clears throat> So I think you probably know about swath plots. So here's an example where we have ordinary Krieg estimates. We have LAK estimates, the number of composites, which is this curve here. And we have the actual gold grade from the drill hole composites by this green line. And I think that's this thick, heavy green one here. And then we see the blue line is our ordinary Krieg. The gray one here is LAK. And so you can see, for the most part, the, <clears throat> the LAK in this example line tends to probably be a little closer to the actual blast hole grade <clears throat> as compared to the ordinary Krieg. So it's another way of looking at it. And of course, these swath plots can be calculated on Eastings, another set on the Northings, another set on Elevations. So it's pretty good. It tells you, you know, how do things compare where my grades are very high? So in this part of the ore deposit, we have extremely high grades. And we can see, you know, what happened here. Here's a little bingo, a little low point here. 
And our estimates, of course, have just smeared it out because uh, of smoothing. And we can also look at this curve here and tells us how many drill hole composites are actually in this point. You know, is this just one or two composites? No. If we look over here, we say it's at least 6,000 drill hole composites in that average point there. So it's uh, definitely something really going on there. Okay, enough of that. We can also calculate grade tonnage curves and look at those grade tonnage curves for LAK and compare them to the grade tonnage curves of your estimator, whatever it happens to be, and see which one tends to predict uh, things that are closer to the theoretical selective mining unit curve. And you remember how we can get those by change of support and using other models like the Herco model, for example. Okay, a little bit about the LAK software. <clears throat> it works with, uh, it's written in Fortran. It works as a standalone program, so you can use it outside of any mining software package that you have. What you would have to do then is dump your a CSV file with your block model coordinates and another CSV file with your drill hole composites. Go ahead and do the Krieging and then import the Krieged estimates back into your software package. That's one way of doing it. That's as a standalone version. With the, We also have a version that's integrated with Mindsight. I don't know, Jeff, whether you're using Mindsight or, or whatever, but it's integrated with Mindsight through the API or Mindsight application programming interface. And in that case, uh, LA can read and write directly to the MindSight block model. So it can read values from the MindSight block model and it can write the Krieged estimate back into the model. You still have a problem of downloading the drill hole composites or the blast hole values from whatever database you happen to be using. We generally do that then through a Python script. So it's rather seamless, and if you have just uh, MindSight users, uh, it's just a couple of extra menu buttons, and it works for them. So that's it. Gives you uh, an idea what LAK is. If you uh, think you're interested in that, let me know. Uh, you wanted some prices? <clears throat> well, we've been selling LAK for ten grand, and it's a one-time price. There's no additional support fees or maintenance fees or nothing like that. It's an unlimited license. You can use it forever. All right. I'm also attached a little write-up on Digger for optimum dig line design. You might be interested in that too. In my opinion, uh, it's, you get the biggest bang for your buck from dig line design, optimum dig line design. You can see that it, it will generally increase your net revenue by between 2 to 7%. And over the course of a year, that can amount to millions of dollars. So have a look at it, Jeff, and let me know what you think. Thank you.